What's happening folks, hope you're all doing well. I thought I would do a little video covering the 10 favourite films that I've watched during the lockdown that I hadn't actually seen before. Due to the fact that a lot of my work dried up and things started to slow down, I had a lot more time to watch movies, so I started to re-watch a lot of my old favourites, and of course, watch some new ones. So here we go, here are my 10 favourite films that I've watched during the lockdown. Coming in at number 10 is a film called The Report which came out last year starring Adam Driver. This film looks at Daniel Jones who leads an investigation into the detention and interrogation program led by the uh, CIA uh, just after 9-11. And what was very interesting about this film was you don't need to have a heavy political understanding of what was going on at that time, however it does help to understand what was going on at that time. And while it's not something that I know a, a hell of a lot about, it's obviously something that is in the cultural memory of a lot of people uh, in this generation. But I think this is a film that really could have faltered if its lead performance was, you know, just no good. Because Adam Driver is what keeps this film interesting. And as it is quite a dialogue heavy film, it could be seen as boring, but if you're invested into this, what's actually going on and what's at stake, it is actually quite a rewarding thriller political thriller in a way, um, but I think Adam Driver really was exceptional in his role. Uh, it's not an exciting film, you know, but it's what's at stake uh, in the investigation to see what, you know, what's about corruption, to see what's being covered up. So for that, I thought it was quite an enjoyable film and you can find it on uh, Amazon Prime. Coming in at number 9 is Logan Lucky, directed by Steven Soderbergh, and coincidentally this film also stars Adam Driver. Basically we'll have two brothers, Adam Driver and Channing Tatum, who decide that they're going to try to execute an elaborate robbery of the Coca-Cola 600 race. What I liked about it is it's got a good balance of comedy and drama, and you can see what's at stake for the likes of Channing Tatum, you know he's got his daughter, and this brother uh, relationship that's there. And I think it's all blended quite well together, but, but it's overall just quite a fun film. And Steven Zuckerberg is known for films like Ocean's Eleven, and it does have that kind of tone to it, um, especially with the pace and everything. Um, it's just a really fun watch, and I really love Daniel Craig's part in it, I have to say. Just his bit in it really has put him up in my books a little. Um, I never rated him as that great an actor, but after seeing that, he really does show quite a bit of range, and he's quite a witty and funny character in Logan Lucky. Um, but overall, highly recommend that if you're looking for a fairly light-hearted kind of comedy to watch. Um, that's also on Amazon Prime at the minute. Coming in at number 8 is All or Nothing, which is a Mike Lee film that came out in 2002, which has a, a fantastic cast. And you've got Timothy Spall, uh, Leslie Manville, and, and a whole bunch of the, the usual people that are on Mike Lee's films. And I did really enjoy this one. Um, it's one of those very loosely plotted kind of films. Uh, the only falter for me was it didn't address some of the things that were established, you know, midway through the story that seemed like they got abandoned. Um, but overall, I think just the performances and what's going on made it very enjoyable. There are some comical moments, but it is a quite a quite a heavy drama that kind of explores social class, uh, the working class issues, um, you know, it's covers kind of stuff like employment, alcoholism, uh, sex, pregnancy, and I know it doesn't sound like a very exciting film to be watching, but uh, there's a lot of truth to it, and um, you're seeing people having a midlife crisis and, uh, and whatnot, and I just thought it was a very rewarding film for how compelling the performances was, and I like Mike Lee's films because they always kind of explore humanity, and I think it's really, really covered well in uh, All or Nothing. At number 7 is a film called A Sun, which is a Taiwan film, which is actually on Netflix at the minute. And I really did, this one really did surprise me. Uh, it's a director, a fairly new director, hadn't heard of before, which looks at a teenager who gets sent to a juvenile prison after cutting someone's hand off, and then it looks at him uh, after getting out of prison, and the whole scenario that he's in with the girl he was seeing becomes pregnant, and from there just stems all the drama. Um, I really enjoyed this one, and it's funny, I just talked about uh, All or Nothing, looking at uh, family drama and, and social class drama, and this film kind of has a mix of crime in there because of his ties with illegal activities. Um, but I really enjoyed this film because it, it looks at how the family is dealing with the situation and the domino effect that, that everything that he has done has an effect on everybody. Um, and the fact that he got his this woman pregnant, that affects that woman's mother. And I think it does come full circle. It's, it's about 2 hours 20 minutes long, um, but it was a really good, honest film. And 
I would highly recommend watching it if you're into that kind of cinema. And in at number six is a film by Wong Kar Wai called Happy Together. I've seen other Wong Kar Wai films uh, and I think every time you watch them they get better. I haven't seen this one before and I have to say his work does have a real unique flavour. This came out in the mid 90s and um, I'm like in the mood for love and Chongqing Express. You can see his exploration of narrative. Um, it's again a bit like Mike, I keep going back to Mike Lee for some reason here. But uh, the idea of a plotless kind of narrative, you know, there is a focus, but there isn't really the, the traditional kind of arcs that you're going to have where, you know, here, here's what's happening, here's what they want, and there's a big resolution. It just kind of explores, and, and, and I think because of that, the, there's something quite organic and uh, fresh about that because you don't really know what way the story's going to go. Um, but Happy Together is a really great exploration of uh, toxic relationships, and it's between two, two men and it looks at all the arguments that they're having and the passion that they're having and I think it, it, it speaks a lot of truth about uh, relationships uh, and just dysfunctional relationships but at the same time it, it's exploring these characters as to what they want and what they can't have um, but I think it's a very rewarding watch again because it kind of taps into humanity my favourite topic but I definitely recommend that if you're into your Asian cinema Coming in at number 5, a very different film called Lonely Are the Brave, starring Kirk Douglas, and I absolutely love this film. I mean, I'll watch anything that Kirk Douglas is in. But anyway, this looks at a drifter, a cowboy kind of character who comes back into town, and he's, he finds out that his friend, one of his best friends, is actually in prison. So he gets the idea to get himself arrested and end up in prison to break him out. The film really stands as an exploration of the loner character, and I think the themes of the death of the West really really ring true and I don't want to spoil uh, like the ending and stuff but um, the idea is we're seeing this cowboy kind of old fashioned character you know he's not tied down to anything oh, he's, just, he's got his horse he's got the clothes on his back and he doesn't he doesn't seek out for wealth or, or um, ownership of stuff of land and I think it brings up a really great point there's a part whenever Kirk Douglas' character actually brings up about you know how there's so many barriers and people own this and how many rules are getting made um, I think that could stand truer now than then and it's kind of a comment on capitalism and, and ownership and, and who, who really has the right to own what, you know, if we're talking about land or property or objects, commodities, vehicles. Uh, I just find it very interesting to see the film exploring that, um, especially as, as America was becoming much, and much more of a rich country. Um, but overall, brilliant performances, and Walter Matthau also plays uh, the police chief who's on, like, trying to find uh, Kirk Douglas's character eventually, and I just love that dynamic, that kind of cat and mouse dynamic that was going on. Um, really enjoyed the film, 100% check it out if you're into Kirk Douglas and uh, films of American cinema in the 50s. At number 4 is The Farewell, which is a film that I actually reviewed a few weeks ago. And um, yeah, really enjoyed this film. Uh, basically, this looks at a character played by Aquafina, a young Chinese woman who is living in New York and she discovers that her grandmother has just been diagnosed with cancer. Now, in Chinese tradition, it seems to be that it's better not to tell the person who has it, and that seems to be a way that a lot of family members deal with it. So she's taking that on board and she doesn't quite agree with it. Um, so the family decide to stage a wedding, they basically rush a wedding and they all head over to China to meet the grandmother and Aquafina ends up going along uh, even though the family doesn't really want that, want her to go because she can't hide her emotions. But I think this is a really, really beautiful film. Um, it's funny, it's lighthearted, um, but it'll have you in tears too. I was really, really impressed with Aquafina's performance because I, as far as I know she's only done like small bit roles in comedy and whatnot in, in like TV shows and stuff. So. I thought her performance it had a lot of great subtlety um, and nuance to it. Now I really enjoyed it. I think that really put the film, uh, held the film together. But ultimately, the film deals with uh, the themes of death. And in Asian culture, you know, there is such a different approach to uh, death and spirituality and, and, and grief and loss. Um, and it's something that I actually did cover this in my dissertation at university when I was looking at uh, death and spirituality in Japanese cinema. Um, because you can really see that, now, I'm not, not, I'm not going to say Japan's exactly the same as China, or China's the same as, 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 as other places in Asia, but there is definitely a different attitude towards these ideas of death and grief, and it really does make us as Western viewers challenged, you know, what's going on in the film, because, you know, when you first hear that, you're like, what? They're not telling the, the person they've got cancer, like, you know, is that ethical? Is it, is it even legal? I, I believe it's not 
legal in America and, and the UK anyway. Um, the person has the right to know. But I, I think it's very challenging. Uh, no matter what your stance is, you definitely get something out of the film. And I think it's a very a very honest film. It doesn't have, it's not trying to push any agenda, obviously, about uh, these ideas of um, dealing with death. It's all about the f what it's doing to the family. And, and and coping with it, but it's it's a really beautiful film, and it's one of the most refreshing kind of drama comedies that I've seen in the past few years. In at number three is Pia Flower, a film directed by Masahiro Shinoda, uh, which is a director of Japanese cinema who's been healed for a lot of his uh, work in like crime films and stuff. And it's one it's a director that I haven't actually explored very much, um, but I really really enjoy Pia Flower. Uh, stylistically and everything, the, the film's quite ahead of its time. The film looks at a man who just got out of prison in the Yakuza and he comes back to discover that you know, a lot of things have changed in the organisation, his power and stance isn't quite the same and he ends up getting mixed up with this uh, young woman um, when they're when they're gambling and she lives quite, lives quite fast and, and she likes to live dangerous and he just explores the relationship that he has with this woman and I find really interesting that the game that they're playing is called Hanafuda I think I've pronounced that right. I think it's called Hannah Food, and it's like this little game, with little cards uh, with like little flower symbols and stuff on it. Um, hence the name Peel Flower. Uh, but again, it was a really interesting film. It felt very ahead of its time. The cinematography was very sharp. Some really interesting dream sequences and stuff in there. The film has a very cool and stylish feeling of like an 80s American film, um, which does kind of show the American influence that was coming in even just before. I know I've just said the 80s, it kind of might sound like a contradiction there. But you can see the American kind of influence in the film because the, the characters feel quite Americanized. You know, they're wearing sunglasses, they're driving fast cars. But overall, really, really good film. Definitely check that one out. And in at number two is a film directed by William Wyler, and it's called The Best Years of Our Lives, which looks at three different men. They're all different ages, uh, and they're all World War II veterans, and it looks at them adjusting back into uh, real life. And this film is nearly three hours long. And I wouldn't have minded if it was actually longer. Um, the characters are just absolutely wonderful to watch to see how, how they're uh, coping with adjusting into, into the normal world again. And I remember one of I, I did make a video whenever I started doing this again and I said that all oh, the film days were like PTSD and stuff and what I liked about it is it, it, it didn't look at PTSD in a way I was expecting you know where it just dealt with all the the trauma and, and the darker, darker sides to it now. The, it does explore that to some extent with people having bad dreams and whatnot. Um, but I, I think the film didn't do it uh, in an over the top way, which I was kind of expecting because of just when the film came out, I would have expected quite heavy handed symbolism and stuff. But I think the film has a really good, genuine heart and it really has stood the test of time. And I think you could get a lot out of it now for what, what it's trying to say about. Uh, mental health of, of soldiers once they adjust into uh, normal life um, and, it, and it's not without its comedy and romance and everything and I, I think that's what makes it a very well-rounded and, and genuine film. Uh, the performances definitely went the long way and I was really I can't remember the name of the character now but he's in his mid-twenties early thirties and he's lost both hands and I think the way it dealt with that is also dealing with disability. This is a film that came out just after, two years after the end of uh, the second world war in the states to see it exploring disability of soldiers and stuff, I thought was was quite interesting uh, and quite forward thinking. And again, it's never doing any of this in a big, heavy-handed and bold way. It's showing it as it is. And I think for that, uh, the best year of our lives is definitely one of the best Hollywood classics of its time. And coming in at number one is a Russian film called Come and See. And if anyone's seen that, excuse my language, but holy good fuck. The film is directed by Elam Klimov and the director actually hasn't done very many other really well, well-known films. Um, when I say that I mean films that you know, have the same kind of status as the, what seems to be his Citizen Kane here uh, with Come and See. Now the director is known for, like, I find this very surprising, known for like comedies and, and TV sitcoms and dramas and stuff. So it was very interesting to see how just breathtaking and, and hard-hitting and bold that the film is. I have this, this is definitely one of my favourite films and I, and I know I'm not going to be in a rush to watch it again soon but it's one that I will look at again. Um, the cinematography was just absolutely intense. With its 4x3 framing it uh, really gave you this sense of, uh, of claustrophobia and, and it really played an advantage with its composition of everything. Um, and like a film like Son of Saul which I think that won the best foreign language film in 2016 or so uh, that film definitely drew influence from Come and See 
uh, with its central framing. You have a lot of you know uh, characters that are just framed, and they're looking right down the barrel of the lens. And it, it, but usually when that happens, the fourth wall is being broken. But here it's not. It's kind of like staring into your soul, and um, you feel like you're the character in the film. And basically, this film uh, is set in Belarus and it explores what the Nazis were doing in Belarus, uh, going in and burning villages down, and basically causing mass genocides. And the thing, I, a couple of years ago, I did not know anything about this, and I just found it incredible. The, the, the more you, you dig into the history of World War Two, the more you find, and then there's so many atrocities that were happening. You know, Nan King's a big example, which was one that definitely wasn't covered when I was at school anyway, and, and neither was this, of course. But uh, what happened in Russia was an absolute fucking travesty. And this film does a really good job of not trying to make any massive political statements. And I know that could be argued for people that, you know, want to talk about politics. Um, it, it definitely is saying something about uh, the whole situation. But what you're really seeing here is how a young boy, and he's meant to be about 14 or 15. By the end of the film, he looks about 50. Uh, but it's, it's looking at his perspective of being caught up in everything and wandering time to time. And it was really, really, really compelling. Really, really heavy film. I don't want to actually get too much into it because I'll, I would be standing here for like half an hour trying to talk about it. But I was just so impressed, and, and the sound design was probably one of the most rewarding things about it. Uh, it really gave it just really made you feel like you were there. Uh, there's so much to it, and uh, you know, I can't even process my thoughts right now when I think about it. But it's an absolute masterpiece, and I highly recommend you check it out. If you've seen any of these films, I'd love to hear what you think, especially about Come and See. And sure, drop down a list of the favourite films that you've watched in the past two or three months. Until then, guys, check out some of the previous uploads, and definitely keep an eye out for the next upload, because I am going to start doing DVD and Blu-ray giveaways. I'm going to actually look at the film collection that I have at the minute, then show some of the films that I'm looking to get rid of, and that I'm selling. Um, I'm just trying to downscale my collection. I'm probably going to get rid of like two or three hundred, which sounds like a lot, but this shelf's still full. So definitely check that out, guys. Um, I think it'd be a good opportunity just to give some stuff away and, and sell some stuff. Um, and then at the same time, I'll go over what I actually have in my collection at the minute. So again, thanks for watching, guys, and I will see you next time.